So, lecture one, three, energy, power, and lumping. So, we begin with so, some for familiar ideas uh, of energy conservation. The law of energy conservation states that for an isolated system, the total energy remains constant. Let E be the function of time representing the total energy in a system and P being the function of time representing power into the system, defined as the time rate of change of the energy in the system. Uh, so the energy in a system can change if it exchanges energy with its environment. We consider this exchange to occur through a finite number of ports, each of which can supply or remove energy, positive or negative power, as shown in figure 1-2, which is this one. So we've got our system peanut, and it's got a boundary, and we're saying that power flows only through a finite number of ports. So I show three ports here. It doesn't have to be three. It can only be four, three, four, and five. No, it can be any number of ports. So this is our uh, uh, way of thinking of power flowing into the system. Power can also be negative, um, so it can flow out of the system as well. <coughs> so this is expressed in an equation for power into a port PI and N ports as the total power is equal to the sum from I equals 1 to N of the power through each port. We construct our systems such that they have no internal energy sources. So we're not going to, there are some, some ways of framing this where you can have internal power generation. We're just going to say if something's generating power, we're going to put that outside the system, draw the boundary, and then power can flow into the system from that. Okay. Lumping. So that's so power is power and energy pretty familiar. Lumping, I think, is uh, uh, well. It's probably a new term to you, but I, we've been doing lumping uh, as long as you've been doing any sort of, of mathematical analysis of the physical world. Um, so lumping is something that uh, we will do a lot of uh, in this class, and this is one of the areas that's probably the most difficult to do as an engineering designer is figuring out how to do this well. Okay, So kind of explore what that means. So we have assumed power enters the system via a finite number of ports. Similarly, we assume the energy in a system is stored in a finite number m of distinct elements, each with energy EI, such that the total energy is just equal to the sum of the energy in each, in, uh, uh, each uh, distinct element. So we call these elements that store energy, energy storage elements. So to give a couple examples, uh, in our electronic systems, we've had capacitors that store, element, uh, store energy. We've had inductors that store energy. And in mechanical systems, we'll see that a mass can store energy by uh, through kinetic energy, so it's one way to store energy, uh, and uh, the, a spring could store energy as well through being compressed or stretched. Considering a system to have a finite number of elements, as we have done, requires a specific kind of abstraction from real systems. A familiar example is the point mass of elementary mechanics. So you guys have, have, probably when you started out in your physics course, you guys talked about the kinematic, or kinetic, uh, kinematic equations, um, and then you started talking about maybe looking at F equals MA eventually on a single particle. 
uh, 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 or sometimes they use the term point mass. Sometimes they talk about particles, sometimes they talk about point mass. Um, we say that this point mass uh, uh, interacts with its environment via specific connections called ports, right? Maybe it's attached uh, uh, to a spring, for instance. So this, this point mass might have a spring attached to it, might be hurtling through the air. Uh, uh, there are different situations that, that we can uh, imagine. And, and it behaves a certain way in these interactions. So if it's a, if it's a, a, a point mass, it's a mass element. So Newton's second law is going to apply to that, that point mass. We do not often, enc often encounter such objects that, that uh, behaves as if it has a mass but has no volume. That's what we're kind of assuming is that this point has mass but doesn't have any volume, can't rotate and stuff. Uh, so we're seeing that it's, it's sort of a little bit of a fiction that we've created, this point mass. But it's useful uh, uh, to us in specific uh, types of analysis. So yet this, this is a useful abstraction for many problems. When we abstract like this, considering an object to be described fully as a discrete object with interaction ports, we are said to be lumped parameter modeling. This is often contrasted with distributed or continuous modeling, which uh, consider the L element in greater detail. So this is one of the sort of fundamental differences between uh, uh, the type of modeling we're going to do in this class, which is lumped parameter modeling, and the type of modeling, mathematical modeling you'll do in most of your other engineering classes. Well, I shouldn't, I shouldn't say that. A good number of them are focused on this more continuous or distributed modeling, okay? And that's, that's very important too. So for instance, an object might be considered to be distributed through space and perhaps be flexible or behave as a fluid. So as you might guess in your uh, uh, material science course, in your mechanics of materials course, in um, uh, some of the machine design course as well, you have a, a perspective that's really thinking about the, the entire continuous rigid body that you have and how it can stretch and flex and how there are um, uh, a lot of nuances to that object, right? Even down to the crystal structure and the microscopic level. Um, and when you take your fluids course, you're going to, so the next semester, take your fluids course, you're going to be thinking of fluid as flowing around and you're going to study how it flows around an object, say. You'll look at the pressure and velocity at all points in the fluid and how they change, right? Uh, it's very um, detailed. So you're going to look at things like the boundary layers that can emerge around an object. Laminar smooth flow versus turbulent flow. Um, there will be a lot of, of detailed discussion of the, you know, the details of how the fluid is moving around. Now, um, we're going to take a totally different approach in this class to electromechanical systems and this, this, this detailed distributed perspective. Uh, um, and we'll consider uh, fluid and thermal systems even next semester in the system dynamics course, dynamics and controls course. And they will uh, uh, also be looked at from a completely different perspective than your fluids course will look at fluids, or the heat transfer course will look at heat. It will be a little bit more similar to the heat. But, um, but what they're doing is they're looking at the detailed description, where we're going to look at sort of um, a higher level of, of uh, approximation. But the type of analysis we're going to do uh, is going to be the better choice in many cases. It just depends on what you're designing. If you're designing, if you're on the ASME human powered vehicle team and you're uh, in charge of designing the aerodynamic shell, well, you need the, the detailed fluid perspective uh, of how fluid is going to move around a body. Um, lumped parameter modeling is probably not going to be super helpful in that case. Uh, but if you were looking at maybe a, uh, a series of holding tanks and pipes that maybe are 
capturing water runoff and you have to make sure that there's uh, you're not going to overflow any of your tanks if you have a storm with this many inches of rain in this amount of time. Uh, that type of analysis, it wouldn't make a lot of sense to use a detailed fluid dynamics analysis where you care about, you know, what, how, does the, how, how does the streamline come off of, you know, the lip that comes into the holding tank and how does that, you know, how does each particle move around in the holding tank? That's way too detailed. You don't, you don't actually care about that. You care about the, the height of the water in the tank. And getting to that extremely detailed level means that you'll never see the full dynamic picture of the whole system. And so remember, we're really interested in the, in the system dynamics, what's happening in the whole system. So you, you might care about what's the water level in each tank and how, how big of a diameter you need for this pipe. Um, those types of questions tend to be answered uh, uh, more easily with a, a system dynamics approach uh, uh, and not a detailed fluid dynamics approach. So that's our, uh, I'm trying to kind of map out the different, like this, because there's a tendency to either say, oh, I like the system dynamics stuff. Um, I, could do, I could just do this analysis on everything. Um, I, fluids was hard, but I could do system dynamics analysis on fluids. So that's cool. I'll just do system dynamics for everything. Um, I'm trying to show you where the sort of uh, boundaries are and why they're there. Um, so you need both. Uh, depending on the problem, you, you might need to apply one or the other, or some mixture of the two. So, determining if lumped parameter modeling is proper for a given system is dependent on the type of insight one wants to achieve about the system. The system itself does not prescribe the proper modeling technique, but the desired understanding does. Every system is incredibly complex in its behavior. If one considers it at a fine granularity, um, the complexity just increases. So in this light, it is striking that simple models work at all. You think about this, like, we're using these really high level uh, uh, descriptions and they work really well to describe in bulk how things work. It's kind of surprising. I mean, it's, it feels like <laughs> it's, a, it's a very... Uh, uh, it's not something that you would have necessarily expected. When you understand the, the complexity of the world, the fact that anything is ordered at all is kind of amazing. <laughs> so, um, and that we can use these simple equations to describe stuff. Nevertheless, uh, lumping is highly effective uh, for many analyses. It is important to note that lump parameter models can be applied at different levels of granularity for the, system, for the same system. Finite element modeling uh, or finite element analysis is sometimes called, uh, FEA, can use a large number of small lumped parameter model elements to approximate a continuous model. Such applications are beyond the scope of this course, but it's important to recognize that um, this sort of approach of taking like a little chunk of nature and saying, okay, this chunk is going to behave in this sort of simple way, but we're just going to take a lot of those chunks. That's, that's another way to extend some of these ideas to do uh, a sort of pseudo-continuous analysis with lumped parameter analysis. So, so this lumping that we're doing, if we take the lumps to be smaller and smaller, uh, we can start to approximate this continuous uh, 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 dynamic analysis too. That's not what we're going to do in this course, but if you take the FEA course, uh, you'll learn how to how to do that. So um, it's pretty. This is that, this is another really important topic uh, in sort of modern engineering analysis is how to how to use this fine uh, uh, chopping up of of uh, your different bodies or fluids and do analysis on on the whole system by doing analysis on all these little guys and connecting them up. So yes. So the only uh, uh, other thing that I wanted to um, mention is that the, uh, the lumped parameter uh, uh, models that we've already been using. So in this course, we've already used lumped parameter modeling, um, and we might not have even recognized it. So the, the resistors, for instance, 
Uh, we said they behave like Ohm's law. It's a pretty good model. Um, but really, there's a lot of there's a lot happening. There's a lot of charge sloshing around in this in this uh, finite little resistor. Um, it's very complex what's going on. So if you wanted to understand, you know, where the charge is actually flowing in this, um, and maybe the defects in it, uh, doing lump parameter modeling tells you nothing about that. So we're taking this resistor as being uh, a lumped parameter model, and the and the uh, parameter that we come up with is its resistance. That describes the input output behavior of it. Um, and uh, we did the same with capacitors and inductors. Uh, we took them to be lumped elements that we could describe just input output um, at a high level. In reality, you know, there's this whole like electric field that gets generated and a, and a magnetic field that gets generated, but we're ignoring all of that. Uh, and we're just looking at it from the perspective of voltage and current, right? So we've been doing this lumping, and in electronic systems, the, you know, which elements are your discrete lumped parameter elements are pretty obvious because they're just the, typically the dis different discrete uh, 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 circuit elements. But remember when we did, we had a little bit of subtlety that came in when we had the diodes. So with the diode, we didn't just have a, a, a model that had just a discrete diode there. We actually put three elements in. We put uh, an ideal diode in, we put a voltage drop in, and we put a resistance in to model how this one discrete element behaves. And that's kind of, uh, uh, that's not as typical of an electronics lumped parameter analysis, but that type of thinking becomes a big part of lumped parameter analyses in other domains, so in mechanical systems. So for instance, we're going to take things like, uh, next week we'll, we'll talk about this, take things like a beam, and we'll say, okay, for the purposes of this analysis, we're going to treat this beam like it's a point mass with a spring co uh, connecting it to the ground, to, to the ground, to something stationary. And maybe for the type of analysis we're doing, that's a sufficient model. Uh, but it, the interpretation of this complex real system into a... Uh, uh, some sort of lumped parameter model, that part is, is hard to do well. And that's one of the most difficult aspects of doing system dynamics and thinking uh, of lumped parameter modeling is how do I choose uh, which lumped parameters to use for this problem. In electronics, again, it's pretty straightforward most of the time, but when you come over to the mechanical side, it gets a lot less straightforward and you have to be uh, able to interpret the problem, understand what you want from the problem, and that requires some intuition, uh, but it also requires that we, um, I guess, develop that intuition through doing a lot of examples, doing a lot of problems. So, uh, and then just, um, if you're, if that doesn't get you far enough, then doing some testing can help a lot too. So, all right. So that's what I've got for this week, and uh, we'll see you guys next week.